please join me in giving him a warm and heartfelt welcome to our forum's first esteemed speaker, Mr. Tom Palmer. Well, thank you kindly. It, it's wonderful to, to actually be in America, and by that I do not include Washington, D.C., but actual America. Uh, I spend a lot of time on the uh, freedom movement globally and uh, working with think tanks, we'll talk a little bit about that later, uh, around the world. And KPI, uh, Kansas uh, Policy Institute, is a real shining star in that constellation. I've also known George and some of the other people involved in this for years. But when I left the United States for the Soviet Union, uh, back in the old terrible days, and to promote capitalism and liberty. I've since then spent most, most of my time outside the U.S. It's led me to think about some of the deep roots of supporting freedom. It's not just about uh, standing up and saying free markets. There is an, a foundation for that, if you will, that helps people to see free markets and the importance of limited government. And that's the idea of being an individual human being with control over your own life. We're offered the option, typically, of the nanny state, the protectionist state, the state will take care of you, the state that will be responsible for you. The welfare state is the state that says, we're responsible for your welfare, that is to say, for your well-being. You aren't. You're not responsible. And anything you do, in effect, doesn't matter. You do recall that wonderful statement recently, you didn't build that. And people who have built lives and achieved things, I think, felt a deep sense of alienation at that and disrespect from our president. So I've just produced a book on the topic, uh, which is available outside, uh, Self-Control or State Control. Uh, it's part of a series of books that I've produced on the reality of capitalism. It's now available in about 40 different languages. The Economics of Freedom, the uh, the morality of capitalism I mentioned after the welfare state, the crushing burden being put on future generations, the basic case why liberty written for young people, a book on why free trade is the greatest guarantor of peace, and then finally this most recent book. But before talking about the themes in that, I want to give a shout out for another book you're going to hear about. We have the author here, Real Heroes by Larry Reed, who's a longtime friend. And I managed to read this book. It's not that hard. It's wonderful. It's well written on the plane coming out here. And it's a great compliment uh, to what, what I've been thinking about, told in a very different way. But I really, really like this book, A Real Heroes. What I produce are kind of snack boxes for the mind. If you get these big treatises by Hayek or Mises, heavy, big books, they sit on the shelf, they make you feel guilty for a long time, and for most people, they don't really read the whole thing. So I found handing out human action, all 1,200 pages, on street corners doesn't change a lot of minds. So instead, I produced a bunch of intellectual snack boxes. They're short essays. You can read one, you can read another. You don't have to read them all. Uh, some people like essays with footnotes because they say, if there's no footnotes, it's not serious. And other people don't like footnotes. So it's got something for everybody whether a Nobel laureate or a business executive or, or a smart a high school student. And when I thought about how much big government we get, it occurred to me that people are focused on the supply side. There are people willing to supply state control over the population. People who desire power for its own sake, we're well accustomed to that. That's one of the, the dark sides of human nature, the desire for power. And then also people say power is useful for other things. When I have power, I can get benefits, I can get subsidies, I can get insider deals, so-called cronyism. Uh, so we understand that there's a supply for state power, but there's also a demand for it. And I thought if we want to address the amount supplied, thinking of as an economist, you need to look at the demand side as well. What are some of the things that go into the demand for state control over our lives? Well, some people feel they're unable to make decisions for themselves. Not many, but there are such people. More people think they're able to make decisions for others. I'm not screwed up, but those other people, they can't decide for themselves. And then also, it is the case that there are people in our society who make bad decisions, and they do screw up their lives. 
And the consequence is other people say, well, they should be stopped from doing that. Or, they screwed up their lives, we should have a government program to help them because they made those bad decisions. And maybe if we could help people to achieve more self-control in their own lives, we would be able to reduce an important part of the component of the demand for government control. So thinking about it, traditional Marshallian cross, supply and demand, uh, the approach we've normally taken is the constitutional route, which I'm all in favor of. We want to impose a limit on the supply of government. Make the supply curve vertical, as they say in an economics course. Okay, that's had some success, and I'm all in favor of that. But it's been rather limited. There's still that demand question. So it occurred to me, maybe we could do something to move the demand curve inward for people to actually have less demand for state power, or state control. And that's what this book really is about. So it's not a substitute for the other things we do to limit government. And I've done a lot of those things. I've been a lobbyist, I worked with the National Taxpayers Union, I spent time on Capitol Hill uh, pushing for bills to limit government power, to cut budgets and so on. Those are all important things. But this was a supplement to that, a missing part in the case for freedom. So it's about the relationship between freedom on the one hand and responsibility on the other. Now, everyone here who, one, has teenage children or has had teenage children or two, was a teenager, and I'm sure that's pretty much everyone in the room, recognizes your typical teenager wants freedom without responsibility. That's normal. That's part of growing up. But adults understand the importance of responsibility, that the life of an adult is a life of freedom and responsibility. Now, unfortunately, when you mention freedom, not so much here in Kansas, but in much of the world where I spend most of my time, it brings up a very different image from the ones that you hold. Irresponsibility, partying all the time, not thinking about tomorrow, having no commitments. I hear it said so often, Oh, to be a free person is to have no commitments. Why, well, look at Joe. Joe here isn't married, doesn't have any commitment to anyone. What a free person. Actually, I think that's kind of sad. Being married means you voluntarily take on a responsibility to another person. That's an exercise of freedom. It's not a loss of your liberty. It's exercising it in a way that enriches your life and what hopes the life of one's spouse. People think it's a life of dissipation, selfishness, that's very common. People who believe in freedom are selfish and generally being out of control. On the other hand, in a lot of audiences when you mention responsibility, this is what comes to mind. Being scolded by the librarian, old people telling you what to do, and overall it's boring. To mention responsibility, in a uh, university audience and at least all the professors, their eyes just glaze over. How dull, how bourgeois, which is about the biggest insult you can offer in an English lit department in the United States. Oops. But it's a big, big mistake. Freedom and responsibility are intimately entwined. And in the book I go through a number of chapters, I've commissioned pieces by very serious scholars that show when you give up one the other one is lost as well. It just takes some time. You can't enjoy one without the other for very long. A society that claims to have freedom without personal responsibility will lose the freedom. It sets in process an irre a, mo a movement that is very hard to reverse. Professor Hayek, in one of those big, thick books, The Constitution of Liberty, made it very clear Liberty means not only that the individual has both the opportunity and the burden of choice, it also means that he must bear the consequences of his actions and will receive praise or blame for them. Liberty and responsible are inseparable. Liberty and responsibility. Now, when you think about it, responsibility isn't, as we are sometimes told, the price you pay for freedom. It's the reward for freedom. 
And that's a very important point. It took me some time to appreciate and understand that. It's the ability to say, I did that. I'm the one who achieved that. I built that, Mr. Obama. We raised this family. We did that. We, in our family, in our community, in our business, we did that. We can take responsibility for that. And that is a great reward. It's not a burden, as it is sometimes portrayed. Indeed, as Aristotle understood, praise and blame, the same words used by Hayek, are the key to a moral life. As he argued, praise and blame are dependent on whether the people in question are compelled or not to act as they do. You don't get any credit for a good deed if it's done under compulsion. It's not generosity when our taxes are taken from us to give someone else to someone else. That is not a generous act. And if you abstain from vice just because you fear being put in prison, you're not being virtuous. If you're in chains, you don't have responsibility. And this is well established in law and in common sense morality. It's praise and blame. If you don't have freedom to make choices, you don't deserve the blame and you don't deserve the praise either. But to be a moral person means we're willing to accept the praise and also the blame for the bad things that we do. It's a key part of the tradition of limited government and personal freedom to connect individual identity with moral responsibility. There was a great movement in England that greatly influenced British political history and American political history with the puzzling name the Levelers. They were accused by their enemies of being Levelers and there's some confusion. They were not communists. They were Levelers in the sense they said everyone should be equal before the law. They believe strongly in equality before the law. Not one law for aristocrats and another one for commoners, one law for Christians, another one for Jews. Everyone, male and female, Christian and non-Christian, to be equal before the law. So that was the sense of being a leveler. And Richard Overton, a particularly influential one, pointed out every person has a property over himself, else could he not be himself. To achieve your individual identity, to be the person that you want to be, you have to have control over your own life. It is a necessary condition. These people really blaze the path for limited government, for the rule of law, for the right to trial by jury, which is maintained because of the levelers. They had a huge impact on the American founders as well. Thomas Jefferson would quote them from memory, and you see Jefferson quotes and the people quoting him often don't know he's actually quoting one of the, or, or, or paraphrasing one of the earlier levelers. It's a deep part of the American tradition. Another great American, Frederick Douglass. In some sense, he brought about the second half of the Declaration of Independence. All men are created equal. And he said, as his famous speech of 1854 on July 4th, he said, it says in our Declaration of All Men, what about me? and my brothers and sisters. And he campaigned and championed equality before the law for everyone, regardless of color or previous condition. And in one of his great books, his autobiography, he talked about what it was like to be a slave. This was a man who had been a slave. He knew it from the inside. He said, look at the slave. He stripped of every right and privilege. He had not even the privilege of saying, my self to say myself, we take it for granted, but it means you have to be able to say my. And the slave could not even say that, stripped of every possibility of dignity. And Douglas went on to be one of the great American founders, in my opinion. He championed our constitution, the rule of law. He was also a great friend of free trade, of sound money, of limited government generally. Many people do not know what an important a freedom advocate he was. Now some people then argue, and you hear this typically in university philosophy departments, oh really? Really? You think people are capable of self-control? You think everyone is rational? Well that's not the case at all. You don't have to presuppose that everyone is calculating in that sense of rationality. Hayek made it very clear when he talked about individualism he was not talking about the cartoon character 
of the isolated, completely self-reliant individual who always knows what's best for himself or herself. I've never met that person. I'm not that person. I make mistakes about my life. Everybody does. That's not what individualism is about. It's about, in fact, understanding our human limitations. Human beings can be irrational and fallible. The point is, in the free society, my mistakes do not become the mistakes for everybody. We have a process in the market economy to correct mistakes. As opposed to under socialism, one power, man has all the power, everyone suffers the consequences of their mistakes. We can visit Venezuela for a very clear, vivid, living example of that today. In fact, as he said, we don't assign responsibility to a human being because we think he can't make mistakes or because he's perfect in his judgment, but in order to make him act differently. That's the point of taking responsibility. When you take responsibility for your acts, you don't leave big messes for other people to clean up. Clean up your own messes. That's the message my mom always tried unsuccessfully to instill in me when I was young. Don't leave problems for other people. When people are free to do that because they don't have responsibility, you create catastrophe after catastrophe. It's when each one of us understands, I bear responsibility for doing that, that we have a better society. The idea of individual responsibility isn't a claim, a metaphysical claim, if you will, that every human being is always the best judge of his or her own interests and never make mistakes. That's an absurd claim. That's what the other side says we believe. But it can't be true. We know it's not true. It's because we assign responsibility so that people will, in fact, behave better than they would otherwise. One of the chapters that I commissioned by Lisa Conyers is a wonderful chapter. I really recommend it. She interviewed huge numbers of people on welfare in America. Those are people whose responsibility was taken from them. And she showed what life is like in that situation. You lose your freedom, your command over your own behavior. And it's terrible. And one I have learned over the years to gain greater respect for people who have been in welfare. They were born into it and managed to get out of it. It is not easy. The welfare state makes it hard to get out of welfare. And people who succeed in doing that deserve our respect. As an autobiographical note, I can mention my own experience. Many years ago, I had two brothers, and uh, one of them had very serious problems with alcohol dependency. So this is not a surprise. I don't feel ashamed to mention this. Uh, and uh, our other brother and I uh, tried to help him a number of times and rescued him. And on one of those occasions, he had hit rock bottom, and we went out and tried to gather his assets. Say, what can we do? We've got to get him into a hospital treatment program. He was going to die. And at the hospital, the very nice social worker, and I gained great respect for social workers. They really help people in difficult circumstances. She said, you know, you can't go to any treatment program, private, public, it doesn't matter unless you go to the welfare office and fill out some papers. So well, we're very uncomfortable doing that. I'm sorry, no private program will look at you. I said, okay, we'll go fill out the papers. We took those papers, we had a listing of all of his assets, his car, everything we could find that we could sell, what it was worth, that we could use. And the welfare worker we met was horrified. Said, oh my God, that, no, no, don't do that. Get rid of all those assets. Spend them down till he has less than $1,500. Then come back and I'll make him my client. That's the reality. That's what it's like. Uh, my brother had to restrain the impulse to just reach across and choke the life out of this bureaucrat. He wanted our brother to be his penniless and his client and then he would take charge. Uh, we did not follow that path. And as Lisa points out, people who do take charge of their lives are able to attain lives of freedom, but it is hard in a welfare state. Now there's also been a great deal of research lately in the brain, and the mind being rooted in the brain. There are various elements of that that can be triggered in various ways, and now we understand better than we did in the past. You always have known, when you're angry or you're touched off, take a deep breath before you do anything. 
it oxygenates the prefrontal cortex of the brain. That's the part that says, whoa, 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 better not to choke the welfare agent to death. Right? It says, whoa, 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 don't do that. Could be bad consequences, even though you're angry right now. And there are various techniques to be able to put yourself more in charge of yourself. And that's a very important part of the book. We've learned a lot about this. We can increase our moral fiber by exercising our freedom. John Tierney, one of the writers who's from the New York Times, has a great book, Willpower, Rediscovering the uh, Greatest Human Strength. And I asked John, I said, John, would you write a chapter but make it more directly about freedom? Because he's a very solid uh, pro-freedom advocate, but being a New York Times writer, that goes a little bit in the back. Uh, he's a reporter, primarily, so he did. said, yeah, let me do that, and I'll make the connection to freedom much more explicit and clear. It's a great chapter, and he pointed out that the research into willpower and self-control is psychology's best hope for contributing to human welfare. There are lots of things from modern psychology we can learn about how to achieve greater self-control, greater happiness, and to become better co-workers, better friends, better family members, and better citizens. Uh, as Roy Baumeister, the co-author, put it in a series of studies, it turns out people who believe in free will are better able to follow rules. Seems paradoxical. They give students various texts to convince them there's no free rule, and it turns out after they become convinced they don't follow rules as well. Whereas the ones who are given the papers showing there is free will turn out to be better rule followers, better citizens, if you will. Now, self-control is sometimes portrayed as rugged. I hate that phrase, rugged individualism. I really, really dislike it. Because it suggests that to be an individualist you have to be rugged or tough. Well, there are dainty individualists. There are feminine individualists. There's nothing necessarily rugged. You don't have to wear a lumberjack shirt to be an individualist, to take control of your own life. You can be feminine or dainty, you can be all kinds of things. You don't have to be rugged or go around chopping down trees. You don't have to be robotic like Arnold Schwarzenegger. It's about being mindful of the things that we want to accomplish. Making sure that we're doing the things that we think we ought to do, not merely reacting. It's about acquiring slowly and over long periods of time sometimes the habits of thrift and punctuality and respect that are conducive to a good life. It turns out those old-fashioned Victorians were on to something. And all those books that my grandparents had, and my parents also, probably the last generation to be raised with these books, about acquiring good habits. When I went through my dad's stuff many, many years ago, I found a note he wrote to remind himself to try to be a better person. He was about 14 when he wrote that. We can do that. We can remind ourselves to be better people and more aware of our lives and more in charge of ourselves. Learning how to control our impulses, to spend, to eat, to do all kinds of things. And there are many techniques now to do this. One of the great things is the development of the smartphone. I downloaded an app called Mint.com. It's great. It reminds me when I'm spending too much money. It monitors all of my spending. It says, Tom, you went over your limit or you're approaching it, and as a consequence, I've gotten more self-control, more control over my own personal finances. Turns out there's lots of these things out there now that can help us to achieve more self-control in our lives. I really recommend Kelly McGonigal's book, The Willpower Instinct. She teaches at Stanford University in psychology. It's a great book, very, very helpful, full of techniques that we can use at any age in life and one of the good news here is this is not only for young people. It turns out neuroscientists have shown the human brain is changing throughout our lifetimes. You can acquire new skills at any age in life and you can continue to acquire virtue. I used to think people got to be 30, that's the way they are, they'll never change. It's not true. We can always improve our ability to live good lives. Now, self-control is also not something we have to give up in a complex society. That's the other thing that we're constantly told by left-leaning professors. Oh, society is so complex, the state has to take charge of it. 
absolutely wrong. In fact, Norbert Elias, who's a sociologist I, re I highly recommend, has shown demonstrably the more complex social orders become, the more they rest on the ability of people to control their own lives, to control their impulses, their transient impulses that might be harmful to others or harmful to themselves, that the more complex a society, the greater the degree to which control is internalized in each and every one of us. Complex societies don't need a boss or a dictator or someone with a big club. It needs widespread moral norms that people internalize. In his books, he showed something quite interesting. Books of etiquette from the 13th century, 14th, 15th, 16th, century, all the way up to the 19th century, and how they change. They, do, they encourage adults to do things so shocking and disgusting you would not expect even a small child to do that today. But it was expected to, sh to for adults, these are the rules of proper behavior. And there were things like, don't blow your nose on your hand and shake someone's hand. Okay? Don't spit across the table. Uh, these were given to elegant society people. When coming to our dinner party, please do not spit on, across the table. Or gnaw on food and put it back in the bowl. Right now, if if you had a four-year-old who did that, that'd be corrected immediately. What he shows is that these rules have become more and more internalized. The societies have become wealthier, more prosperous, and more complex. Now, freedom in that context is a social idea. It doesn't mean being isolated. This is the other false image of freedom we are presented with constantly. Oh, freedom means only being a hermit, going off on your own, living by yourself, living in a cabin. That's not what freedom is. That's isolation. Freedom is about living in a community of free persons governed by the rule of law. Every person free to run his or her own life and respect those of others. And the more complex the social order, the greater the need for freedom. It is not the case, again, that to be a free person is to be isolated or antisocial. Freedom is the most social of all political principles, not antisocial at all. Now, there's some good news in this regard. We can develop techniques to improve our self-control and we hope diminish demand for government, learn how to make de better decisions, to take charge of our own lives, and the book contains some of those techniques. What's well, a self-help book? And I figured lots of people buy self-help books and maybe this will help on promoting it, but there's bad news at the same time. There are governments that insist that you should have neither the freedom nor the responsibility to make your own decisions. And that governs saving for retirement, right? Don't worry, Social Security is going to take care of that. And I should mention to anyone, so the younger people in the audience, uh, don't count on it. Uh, just do not count on it. Uh, you need to start saving for your old age because my generation is going to suck up all of your savings. So you have to save for your grandparents, your parents, and yourself. I'm sorry, and I'm ashamed and embarrassed that my generation has left that for you. But the fact of the matter is you need to be aware of that. And then also what you get to ingest, what medical choices you will make, negotiating your own wage, whether you engage in risky behavior and sports, whether you have to wear a motorcycle helmet, after all, if the government's going to pay for your health care and you have an accident, well, they get to dictate the behavior you take and mandate a helmet. The logic is pretty clear, but it means you lose your responsibility and your freedom. Some more bad news. Welfare states are undermining the norms that made possible our prosperity. And there's a chapter in the book by Nima Sanandaji, a Swedish economist, that makes it very clear. This blue line up here is entitlement spending in the United States and how that has increased so dramatically it is now dwarfing all other elements of the federal budget. This other line here, these rising lines, are the percentage of young people between 18 and 29 on permanent disability. And it counts a number of societies in the Nordics, in the United States, United Kingdom. These are societies that are becoming richer healthier and longer lived because prosperity makes us able to afford those good things 
And what is happening in our societies when more and more young people say, I'm permanently disabled, I cannot work, I go on disability for life. Something is happening here that is not healthy and not sustainable over the long term. One of the things that uh, Sanandaji points out is the following. It's very important. We hear from the left all the time, look at the Nordic countries, those are high trust societies, they're good societies, and indeed they are. And it's the welfare state that made them that. And Sanandaji says that is not the case. The fact that they were high trust, hard working societies made welfare states sustainable for longer than in societies with different mores. Because people paid their taxes and they didn't overclaim benefits. But now, what's happening? That's being eroded. As he looks at the question, claiming government benefits to which you are not entitled is never justifiable. Going back 1981-84, 82% of Swedes and 80% of Norwegians said, yeah, that's right. It's never justifiable. Those numbers declined dramatically in the subsequent years. 2005 to 8, 56% of Norwegians said 61% of Swedes said that move forward just a few years. 2014, and it had fallen to 55%. So what's happening in those societies? The idea of self-respect is being eroded. That is not sustainable. It lasted much longer than in societies with lower levels of social trust, but it is eroding it. And by the way, as he points out, if you look at levels of social trust among Swedish and Norwegian Americans, they're higher than they are in Sweden and Norway. It's the Swedishness and Norwegianness that creates social trust, not the welfare state. Milton Friedman had the famous line years ago when a, a Swedish prime minister said, you know, we don't have any poor Swedes in Sweden. And he said, well, that's a very interesting point because we have no poor Swedes in America also. It seems to be it was the Swedishness uh, that mattered, not so much the politics. But there are some others as well, and I'll mention a controversial issue that's getting more here in the United States. The war on drugs. Take away people's freedom to make choices, and you generate some very terrible consequences. We had 2013, the last year with full data, uh, about 44,000 people died of drug overdoses. Almost all of those are because of the war on drugs, not because of the pharmacological properties per se. It's because this is how these people die. We've also seen extraordinary explosion in violent crime, 1971 to 1993 in the United States but also south of the border, where really horrific drug gangs are tearing apart our southern neighbors. When I originally did some research on this, I googled the following phrase, do not do this, by the way. I said, murder victims, Mexico drug war, and looked under images, don't do that. It was shocking, it was like ISIS, but happening uh, just south of us. One of the things that Jeffrey Myron from Harvard University pointed out in his chapter in the book is he said, there's a strong correlation with violence and prohibition. It happened with alcohol, rise in here in violent crime, and then with the war on drugs. Well, maybe we're protecting people. As he points out, you want to find the height of deaths from cirrhosis of the liver? It's during prohibition. We were not protecting people from alcohol. We were forcing them from beer and wine into vodka and gin, bathtub gin, and all kinds of much more dangerous substances. And then finally, the impact on civil liberties. Uh, wiretaps that are always justified to protect us from terrorists, these are the ones that are related to the war on drugs. Increasing surveillance of the society. Now, what does it mean to have freedom? It means the rule of law, not being subject to arbitrary power. And Hayek made this point so clearly in the great book, The Road to Serfdom. It's one of the turning points of our century in 1944. He said the point of the rule of law is to present, prevent the government from engaging in ad hoc behavior. That's what creates the framework for our freedom. Next point I'd like to make, and this is one that has to do with how we sell or promote the ideas of liberty in the free market. Quite often I hear people say, I'm against regulation, I'm for an unregulated market. And that scares people, and I'm not in favor of that. I, I'm on record. I am in four regulated markets. Markets regulated by the rule of law, not by executive agencies with arbitrary power to invent new rules and change them at will. That's not the rule of law. 
The rule of law means people enter business, they know what the rules of contract are, you sign a contract, you're bound by it. The normal rule of law, which provides plenty of regulation. This is what James Madison meant when he wrote the power to regulate commerce, to make it regular, not to intervene arbitrarily and capriciously. Lynn Kiesling presents a case uh, a study on the role of property rights. Property rights make us responsible for our behavior. That's why they're so important. <clears throat> it's when people have property that they think about the long term. They can capture the capital value of an asset by making it more valuable. And they are responsible to others when those other people have property rights. You can't just dump garbage in your neighbor's front yard because they own it. It's when there's no property rights that people dump garbage into something. The oceans, the air, and so on. And she points out very neatly the importance of property rights in generating responsibility for behavior. If people don't have property rights, even nice people will do bad things to each other because there's no mechanism to make us responsible for our behavior, which is one of the great functions of property. The other point, and there's a careful study, we are told, well, government has to provide all the regulation. And two, uh, an economist and a historian whom I commissioned did very detailed case studies, but fortunately they're short and not too long, of two hard cases. They looked at land use and financial markets, and they pointed out before the government created special bodies to intervene in these, there were already well-functioning regulatory institutions that emerged from the market and generally they work much, much better. So I highly recommend that as a case study. All these essays were original. They put out, we want markets regulated by the rule of law rather than detailed and minute commands and prohibitions. These have existed, they do exist, and they can fulfill what people want when they say we want well-regulated markets. And lastly, what we promote is not life, liberty, and happiness, but life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. It's the pursuit that makes us happy, not merely getting to the end goal. And our Constitution <coughs> and our founding documents promote the, the right to the pursuit of happiness. Now, people do read a lot of books on self-help. This one will help uh, readers. It's aimed at a younger audience, but not exclusively how to economize on willpower, how to make better decisions, and techniques, monitoring our behavior. There are a lot of ways that we can learn from psychology how to do a better job. So the book is full of suggestions on that. And then lastly, uh, controlling our impulses. One of the things that turns out a very important way and helpful to get young people to save more for the future is to imagine their future selves. When you're 22, the idea of being 65 is just unthinkable. It's unthinkable. You can now get computer programs that morph your photograph into what you're going to look like at 65. It turns out when students see that, they change their saving behavior. Because they say, I don't want that person to be miserable. Well, it looks like, like a nice person. And I don't want him or her to suffer and be in poverty. So I will give gifts to that 65-year-old. In the absence of that, people don't connect themselves today with themselves in the future. Replacing bad habits with better habits, psychologists have since shown something that I think most of us have found out. You cannot get rid of a bad habit. If you have it, it's actually wired into your brain. The physical substrate of your brain has that habit in it. What you can do is replace a bad habit with a better one. And there are techniques for doing that. And so I'll conclude with that. Aristotle got it right at the beginning. Ethics is about ethos. It means habits. The ethical life is a life in which we acquire the habits of good behavior. Those are about self-control. He said, how do you become a house builder? Do you sit in on college classes? You build houses. How do you play a guitar? How do you learn to play? By playing the guitar. How do you become better people? By exercising our self-control and our freedom to become the people that we want to be. 
And for that, we need limited government and the rule of law. So the book's available outside, and it's available in all kinds of e-versions, which you can download. And I'm really looking forward to Larry Reed's talk, because his chapters exemplify the life of self-control that I tried more theoretically to present in my book. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>